introduce our first panel, the, uh, the Future of AI. It's being um, uh, uh, hosted by Matt Griffin, founder and CEO of 311 Institute. Matt, would you like to start? Yeah, well, thank you, Armani. So thank you, Stelio. So hello, everyone. How are you? I hope you're well. So traditionally, as a keynote speaker, my, my view of you all basically would be you sitting in an audience. However, welcome to my virtual studio, such is the way today. So today we're going to be having a conversation about the future of artificial intelligence. Now, we're really going to be looking at about the next 20 years. Um, we're going to be looking at some good things, some bad things, some expected things and some unexpected things. So Firstly, the future of artificial intelligence is not necessarily what you think. And by this, I mean the deep future of artificial intelligence. You're going to have to wait until the end to figure out basically what I mean by this statement. Secondly, consider this. We don't actually live in the age of artificial intelligence yet. So I've been having lots of conversations with my peers over at MIT, and they tend to agree with this. Yeah, we live in an age of increasingly smart automated machines. So when you have a look at, for example, machine learning, it's very much, if this happens, then I do that. Uh, really, when we start talking about artificial intelligence, where intelligence is the main quotient that we care about, that's really where we start looking at things like neural networks and so on and so forth. So we're, we're getting there, but yeah, we're still a little way off, basically, from really seeing intelligent machines come to the fore, particularly when we start talking about machines that can rival human intelligence. Now, there are three, predominantly three, at a very high level types of artificial intelligence uh, per se. So you have artificial narrow intelligence, which we use every single day. In fact, you could almost argue we use it every hour and every minute of every day. We have artificial general intelligence. This is due to arrive in about 2035. We actually have some artificial intelligence, some artificial general intelligence blueprints, courtesy of Google DeepMind. Uh, they produce something called Impala. So narrow intelligence, you can kind of think as, of as one brain that does something very, very well. Artificial general intelligence is where you take together multiple specialisms, multiple brains, and you kind of aggregate them together under one general brain. I won't say super brain, that comes in a moment. I say, and that single general intelligence doesn't just know one thing very well, like ANI, it knows lots of things very well. Now, the third one that we talk about is artificial super intelligence. Typically, people think that this will emerge around 2045 to about 2060. The jury's kind of out on that. Uh, when we get to artificial super intelligence, that's where we start talking about breaking nuclear fusion. That's where we start talking about unlocking the secrets of interstellar, interstellar travel and immortality and all these kinds of things. And actually, ASI, when we start having a look at the future, you know, the future that everyone is kind of a little bit wary about, really ASI is the one that starts putting the human race onto the back foot significantly. So uh, when we have a look at artificial intelligence's sort of general facts and fallacies, you know, there's a huge amount of hype around artificial intelligence at the moment. The first thing is even the world's most advanced artificial intelligences, like the ones from Baidu, Google, OpenAI, Microsoft, all these kinds of other organizations, can be kicked by a four-year-old. You know, a four-year-old has better reasoning capabilities than even the most advanced artificial intelligences used by, for example, the national security agencies, and so on and so forth. Uh, secondly, a lot of people make stock of this, that countries and organizations who have huge volumes of data will win in the future of artificial intelligence. It's not necessarily going to be the case. So for example, we've got the Singularity Network, uh, where we put artificial intelligence and blockchain together to create a kind of decentralized, distributed artificial intelligence construct. Um, but when we start having a look at the future of things like less than one shot training, zero shot training, these are where you can give artificial intelligences, for example, Google's DeepMind again, uh, with the likes of AlphaZero, you can give it the rules for chess. And it will then play chess millions and millions of times based on those rules without ever having to be taught how to play chess, say, for example, by a human or a data set. 
and it will then figure it out for itself. So we've seen quite a number of what we call zero shot artificial intelligences coming through already. Again, the usual kind of suspects where artificial intelligences aren't specifically haven't aren't specifically having to be given huge data training sets in order to learn new things, whether it's capabilities, whether it's knowledge. And speaking of knowledge, artificial intelligence makes its own knowledge. We've seen this with things like AlphaGo. So humans basically are taught to learn in a one particular way. Artificial intelligences aren't bound by the way that humans learn. So they will learn in a completely different way. Now, this is actually an advantage for humans because we learn in one way, they learn in another. And when we've gone back to people like Garry Kasparov, basically who got beaten by Deep Blue all those years ago, uh, he was the chess grand champion and the AlphaGo champions. When you go back to them and say, you must really, really hate being beaten by an artificial intelligence. Typically they say no. And the reason why they say no is they say, because as a human, I learned how to play Go in this way. The artificial intelligence learned Go to how to play Go in a completely different way. And so what I did is I took what I already know, I combined that with the techniques that the artificial intelligence found, and I'm now an even better player. Um, we're actually applying these same constructs basically to things like decision-making, strategy, so particularly when it comes to things like war games, the US military, and so on and so on. So AI literally makes its own knowledge. Now, AI has also got a memory problem. So as the, as the different models get larger and larger, we've seen, uh, for example, open AI's data model, um, things like GPT-3, they've got about a trillion parameters. We've got Google's NLP model, which is 1.6 trillion parameters. We've seen a model coming out of China, which is now 1.7 trillion parameters. One of the biggest problems that artificial intelligence has, and this is why you can't talk to Siri, or Alexa is because they forget. So if you go and try and have a conversation with an artificial intelligence, it can't remember what you said one or two sentences ago. Now we do have conversational artificial intelligence coming through courtesy of companies like Amazon, and you should really start seeing those being pushed out to your smart home devices in about the next year. There's some quite interesting battle bot uh, competitions that are going on where AIs will talk to one another and they will actually be training one another on how to have conversations. So things like small talk, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe how to do a presentation. Maybe I can rest on a beach one day. AI also has a significant energy problem. As these models get larger, you know, I mentioned Google's NLP models are now 1.6 trillion parameters. We're seeing artificial intelligence energy usage and consumption just go vertical. So for example, here, we've actually got things like AlphaGo. Uh, we've got some of the DeepMind uh, artificial intelligences and OpenAI AIs. And you can see basically that white line, the blue line is actually blockchain. So blockchain's energy consumption just is almost vertical. AI's energy consumption is very, very similar and it's increasing at a staggering rate. Now, when we start trying to have a look at how you solve the problem that is artificial intelligence's energy consumption, we've got a couple of options. So we've got IPUs from companies like GraphCore. So IPUs are intelligent processing units that are the next GPU. You can train your machine learning models a hundred times faster than using the NVIDIA's best GPU. Uh, we've got neuromorphic computers coming through as well. So neuromorphic computers are kind of self-learning computers. They're based on something called memristors and artificial neurons, a little bit like the human brain they will be able to very soon pack all of the power of the US Department of Energy's summit supercomputer into something the size of a fingernail that runs on a AA battery. So if you can again consider this, the human brain runs on the equivalent of two AA batteries and it occupies about a liter of space. You know, neuromorphic computers kind of mimic that ar architecture. We also have shallow neural networks courtesy of the US military. So for example, a shallow neural network, uh, again, we've seen one from MIT, just as a little example, that was able to control a fully autonomous car, but with 16 neural networks. So 16 uh, 
neurons, essentially, uh, as opposed to these huge models basically that we see today when we're developing uh, AIs for fully autonomous vehicles. So there are solutions basically to AI's energy problem. Next up, AI has an image problem, mainly thanks to Hollywood, um, because in the future, we think AI is going to come and kill us. You know, we don't generally look at the future as being utopian. We think robots are going to come and kill us. Now, we are actually seeing the, the development of fully autonomous kill chains again in the military. We are seeing hunter killer drones, hunter killer robots uh, being developed. The United Nations keeps having conversations about these, but Russia, the UK, the US and China keep pulling out of those conversations and won't agree not to develop fully autonomous weapons. Um, and again, recently, the US military went on record to say that when it comes to battle, humans are now the weak link. So in other words, the weak link compared to technology, where technology is much more than just AI. So that's not a fun place to be. Um, and then, of course, there was this. So Google, about two years ago, decided that they put two artificial intelligences in competition with one another. The AIs had to fight for resources. They had a little AI that had access to small amounts of compute and a bigger AI that had access to lots of compute. What they found was that the larger AI was able to outmaneuver and outstrategize the smaller AI. And in Google's own terms, the larger AI became aggressive when it came to trying to get its own resources. Um, so you can go and look that one up actually on Google. And if you do that, artificial intelligence will actually help you find that particular article. Um, now, this science sort of comes, uh, now we start sort of thinking about how do you control artificial intelligences? There've been lots of papers suggesting you can never control an ASI, um, but this is where we have the concept of something called containment algorithms. So a containment algorithm, and there's lots of different ones, but frankly, there's not enough research yet. Google developed a kill switch. Containment algorithms simply look for bad behaviors within rogue AIs and then try to terminate them. So trying to keep the genie in the box. But as I say, AI development is accelerating very, very quickly. When we start having a look at the development of AI kill switches, containment algorithms, not so good. Now, explainable artificial intelligence. As we start seeing AI creep more and more into some of our heavily regulated industries like healthcare, financial services, the transportation sector with autonomous vehicles, we want to know why that AI made the decision to do whatever it was that it did. Why did it turn that corner? Why did it buy that stock? Why did it provide that treatment to that patient? This is where explainable artificial intelligence comes in. And we're seeing some quite interesting developments from companies like NVIDIA, Cornell, MIT keep coming up again, University College of London, and so on and so forth. Um, but when we start having a look at how we regulate artificial intelligence in the future, explainable artificial intelligence is going to be key. Even in the field of cybersecurity, where an AI will decide that's a threat and it will kill that threat. Why did it make the decision that it did? Um, AI is increasingly being used in decision-making within businesses and boards. Why did it decide to buy that stock? Why did it decide to promote that strategy over this strategy? And so on and so forth. So you can see the benefit of having explainable AI. But for all of AI's kind of downsides and sort of issues, there are some significant upsides. Thanks to artificial intelligence, a COVID vaccine that really should have taken 10 years to go from concept to, to people's arms, uh, that would have taken about 10 years, actually took about three months to develop, six months worth of human clinical trials. And here we are, we're all being vaccinated against the global pandemic. So when we have a look at things like drug development, we actually have artificial intelligence within silico that's generated 31,000 new drugs in 21 days. It's creating products. It's helping Airbus design the next generation of A330neos. It's helping Under Armour design new trainers, Amazon design new fashion lines, and so on and so forth. So there's lots of good. It also helped Toyota develop a new electric vehicle battery in 16 days, bearing in mind that that normally takes about two years. Um, and that's with testing. So there are some significant upsides when we start talking about the benefits of artificial intelligence, particularly when it starts to coming, when we start talking about things like research and development, innovation, uh, healthcare treatments, diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now we also 
kind of are on the cusp of giving, handing over our own free will to AIs. So we already live in what I call the algorithmic society. Now, what I mean by that is consider this. Does artificial intelligence influence your life today? The answer is actually yes, and it influences it more than you might think. So every aspect of your life today, in some way, is influenced by AI. So for example, your loans and your mortgages typically get approved by a machine learning algorithm. You are authenticated by an AI using two-factor authentication, biometrics, behavioral um, sort of authentications as well. Um, we've got AIs creating content. So this is kind of synthetic media, but also deep fakes, you know, and that's a conversation in itself, making products. Uh, you've got smart homes where AI is increasingly controlling your home. It's controlling how you heat your home, when your heat goes on, when your heat goes off, et cetera, et cetera, your air conditioning. It's involved in decision-making. It's feeding you your news. Your news feeds are shaping your views. So we all know this problem. Yeah, you, you like this type of content, so AI keeps showing you more of that. Now, if you are an extremist, if you are at risk of being radicalized, that's a danger. But we actually have solutions for radicalization where we can start combining radicalized feeds and drip feeding different points of view into feeds. So that's a, to give you an alternate view, so that's kind of an artificial intelligence algorithm uh, construct. Um, AI even finds your partner, you know, when you go on to Tinder or when you go on to eHarmony or you go on to Match, yeah, you are matched to someone else by an AI algorithm. Uh, it helps you find your job. When you have your job, increasingly it's being used to manage you, particularly if you work for Amazon or Uber. And in some of those cases, it's also being used to fire you. So, for example, Amazon and Uber, particularly Uber, recently got taken to court in Europe because the artificial intelligences were monitoring the productivity of the Uber drivers. And then if they didn't meet particular KPIs, they got fired by algorithm. Um, it's also recommending products. It's shaping your views. It's talking to you. Increasingly, you are able to talk to computers and the devices around you because of AI. So it's everywhere. But that's ANI. So if that's just ANI, which is kind of the most basic form of artificial intelligence that we have, in fact, it's not even really artificial intelligence. Just imagine what we're going to be able to do in the future. And then speaking of that, I said, the future of artificial intelligence is not what you think. So today, basically, AI is typically neural networks and it's binary code, it's ones and zeros. We have already 3D printed artificial intelligences. So that's called a diffractive neural network. So that's been done over in Silicon Valley. And when I say printed, I mean printed. Yeah, you can physically hold an artificial intelligence. That's a fun one to look up. We've also created neural complex neural networks that have been able to perform calculations in DNA. So we have DNA neural networks. They're also called wet neural networks as well. So start considering what you might be able to do with a DNA-based artificial intelligence. Um, you could technically turn organisms into new interesting types of intelligent life. Um, so that's quite a sort of crazy connotation. There's lots of sort of different ramifications on that one, obviously. And then circa, it's already here, but circa sort of 2025, this one really starts taking off. We have quantum artificial intelligence and quantum deep learning and quantum machine learning. And quantum computers are easily able to process data and typically optimization problems hundreds of millions of times faster than classical computers. So for example, over in China, they recently solved a particular mathematical problem that would have taken a classical computer about two and a half billion years to solve, but they did it in a couple of minutes. Um, so when we start having a look at quantum computing, which again is another topic in itself, you know, imagine having an ANI, an AGI, 
and or an ASI that either operate, for example, in DNA and or in the quantum technology realm. That's it. You end up with some really quite crazy constructs. And that's it from me. So I hope you enjoyed the sort of that 20 minute sort of uh, preview of the future of artificial intelligence. My name is Matthew Griffin. I'm a futurist and I'm looking forward to seeing you all live in the flesh one day soon. Thanks to AI. Take care. Goodbye. Goodbye.